Um, Madeline uh, Kaiser is a uh, mother, climate justice activist, poet, and the creator of the Tucson-based Inside Outside Poetry and Sustainability Program, currently rooted in uh, the Arizona State Prison. Which one? Uh, the one on my right. Okay. All right. Uh, like many programs taking shape around the country, Inside Out embraces the vision of prisons as anchor institutions. Um, I just um, or hubs of uh, positive social and economic and environmental change as the climate shifts. This vision creates platforms inside and outside of prisons for those who are incarcerated and returning to society to teach community members about resiliency. In May 2017, incarcerated veterans trained a first cohort of University of Arizona students traveling to Costa Rica to address uh, water scarcity. Okay, uh, Grace, why don't you go ahead and uh, this is Joe Watson, our fellow panelist, who I'm meeting for the first time. Uh, this is actually what the conference is about. Meeting people from South and North get together and, uh, and see each other's work for the first time. Okay. Do you want to read those too? Um, or do you want to? Why don't you go first and I'll read yours. Yeah. Um, does everybody have a packet by now? Um, and do you want us just to pause for a few minutes and just wanted to... You've got about finalize. 15 minutes. Okay, great. Let's finalize the format. Um, while, uh, as I'm getting started, I just wanted to pass around this box, which you will see is a pizza box. It was actually made by one of the incarcerated community leaders on the Whetstone unit in the state prison. Um, I would invite you um, to write something about... Um, we had started out with a meditation on emptiness. Um, the chair is meant to represent the people who help prepare for this conference in the state prison in, in Tucson, but and through the writing that you're reading. But in return, they wanted on Valentine's Day to first wish you a happy Valentine's Day. But thinking of emptiness, if you would write about anything in your life that is currently empty. Um, because we all have losses. We all have that emptiness. Um, and how you might be addressing that. Um, where is also the fullness in your life? Um, so I will pass this around. And again, this will be, this will be taken in um, next Monday to a number of different groups. And it would be great to have that harvest of writing. Um, I feel a little bit awkward going before my colleague, Joe. Um, Please go. I started teaching 15 years ago in the federal prison. I was brought in by the National Endowment of the Arts and Federal Bureau of Prisons to be a poet in the system. Um, at the same time, my husband is in the front row. Um, he's from Costa Rica, and we started working on water issues. So the prison teaching, in part, was to help um, finance the water work that we were doing in Costa Rica. And very soon, though, teaching this incredible group of men um, in the federal prison, the couple of questions became apparent. Why are our prisons full and our rivers empty in this country? Is there any correlation? Um, as poetry requires us and as art to make these strange connections, that was the first question. Fuller prisons, emptier rivers. The second was, perhaps in a time of storms and fires, shifting climate. Maybe we've locked up some of the leaders we need to see us through who are most resilient. Um, but there's a wider story to be told about our full prisons and our empty rivers that correlate with poverty, that correlate with hope, hopelessness, that correlate with the crisis of despair, with the opiate crisis. Maybe all of these are a flourishing, all of these branches of one root a lack of connection, a lack of purpose, a lack of selfless, selflessness and devotion. Um, to be quite honest, I was, I was asked to leave the federal system um, twice. I was invited back in and disinvited, um, in, part <laughs> um, in part for things like this. Like, maybe on Valentine's Day, the, the real question is, what is love really? What is love if it doesn't allow us the space and the room to ask of each other and be able to articulate the most important questions that we often don't find words for? Um, what is love if not um, the requirement that for people we love and people we don't, 
we say these difficult truths. Um, so in the federal system, some of the questions people began to ask were precisely, you know, is this still a democracy? Um, why do we have so many prisons? Um, what about my family? Um, so I've been teaching for 15 years, and um, in tandem with a movement that's taking shape slowly across our country, thankfully in a time of climate change, um, that other programs are making, and other people, other communities are making the same powerful connection. Um, we have maybe locked up some of the leaders we need in a time of profound social, economic, and environmental change. Um, one of the lead prisons, which, and it's a model for some of the work that's going on here in, in the state prison in Tucson, um, is San Quentin. And basically what they're doing is, on the inside, creating community with, not for, people who are incarcerated. Um, through gardening, through poetry, through yoga, through what in, in informal terms is called a green pipeline. Restoring heart and self, creating community on the inside in order to bridge it outward to corollary opportunities, um, to plant gardens, um, to very much like our, in, in Tucson, our own beloved flowers and bullets group, raise goats, um, create a solidarity economy to address mass incarceration full rivers, full prisons, empty rivers, and switch that. Um, so the model is also one of asking our country, we're looking at cities that are falling apart as the climate shifts, New Orleans, Detroit. Um, can we have anchor institutions from schools that plant gardens, from hospitals that begin to advocate for public health? But nowhere in the country, really, are prisons being held up as anchor institutions or hubs of positive change. So this national work going on, which is taking shape slowly in the state prison, is really about that. It's about a major thump to reframe the way we see our prisons. They are anchor institutions. They are helping us strip away the materialism that has us incarcerated. Who is really incarcerated? Which spirit is really free? So in the Whetstone Unit, which was established for veterans by the governor, um, there's a wonderful chain of programming taking shape. Um, the U of A compost cats have composting. Um, we have our incarcerated leaders, our OG community advisory group. Um, we have the writing from the U of A and Marsha. Um, we have many different programs beginning to unfold simultaneously. After one year of this work, um, the, and not only because of it, the warden received warden of the year, the CO3, the correctional officer, Melanie Ubeta, who was going to be here, um, but couldn't make it, um, received correctional officer of the year. And those of us involved in, received an invitation to take the programming from the veterans unit and spread it out into the rest of the prison. Um, but it all has one common denominator, which is that it's looking to those on the inside to be leaders, not just for themselves, but for the rest of us. Um, and again, because maybe we have locked up some of the leaders that we need, we need in this time to help us make this transition to solidarity. Um, I want to leave enough time for Joe to say his say, but I wanted to segue. I was wondering if you would read um, the packets, again, you have before you, the leadership part and writing as part of that um, that I help lead is these, these men inside the prison prepared, have been, been preparing for today for three weeks. And so they, these are the pieces they wanted you to have. Um, and again, just the empty chair was part of this discussion. Um, the discussion was, aren't teachers in some way part of the system? Um, if there is funding, should it not go entirely to people who have been in the system? Um, our colleague Grace Gomez, um, who is going to be here, usually raises that question. and It's made a lot of people uncomfortable, but these necessary questions are the ones that need to be in the front of the room. So um, they basically, these, this is the writing that they wanted read, uh, two groups of men in the state prison. And I just thought maybe we could segue and have you 
read the first one, that's their intro, um, the one on the first page. And then the second You read it? No. Oh, all so, right. You read answers. Let, let, yeah, if you um, want to read answers. Yeah, I'm going to ask you. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to do that, but right now, real quick, our colleague Grace, I'm going to text her the building and the room number. <laughs> <laughs> Imagining all of these uh, visitors uh, looking desperately for. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is that both Grace and I went to ASU, so I don't really know what to talk about. <laughs> but ASU changes so quickly. Yeah. Changed so much, yes. I keep teasing Joe. I just got a, I just got a cell phone, <laughs> and uh, he's <laughs> he has mastered the art of social media, so I would not know how to text Grace right now. <laughs> you have your cell phone on you. Okay. All right, so um, I'll read uh, this cover from Ansar. Subject, community reentry and bridging gaps. Please take recognition of our empty chair. It's symbolic of the missing element in our society. Acceptance of those who have made mistakes and the roles they could play in our world. Thank you for just the open forum and the recognition of this empty chair. It's truly me there in spirit. Thanks for your time, Ansar. All right, um, why don't, Joe, why don't you go now and uh, let me introduce you a bit. Um, Joe Watson's a researcher for American Friends Service Committee, Arizona. He went to ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and has written for Phoenix New Times, Maxim, Food and Wine, and the Arizona Republic. He was incarcerated for more than 10 years before his release in June 2017 and now leads a workshop at the University of Arizona Poetry Center teaching participants how to mentor incarcerated writers through a creative uh, writing correspondence course. He is also a 2018 McDowell Fellow. Joe. Um, I met Madeline a little over a year ago, uh, about 13 months ago, um, and I think that the way that our, our, um, our group, our workshop, I'm not really sure uh, what to call it, um, kind of came about the same way I, I feel my, um, my writing career has transpired, um, you know, there's a, a phrase that we like to use pretty often in prison, and, and it seems to be catching on in the free world, fake it till you make it. Um, it's kind of how I felt when I first started going to this group. Uh, I had no idea what we were doing, um, but we seemed to develop some sort of purpose, some sort of semblance of, um, of what this was going to be. Um, you know, before I went to prison, um, I had this uh, imposter syndrome, this fraud complex, being a writer. I had never studied technique or structure, anything like that. Um, but I just kept doing it uh, as a journalist. And um, somehow it, it seemed to work. I just kept, kept at it. Uh, it started to look like something that you might read in the newspaper or or in a magazine, and that was good since that's where it was being published. Um, and being in, in Madeline's group, um, at first we sort of thought that we were just going to be going to a creative writing <coughs> workshop, uh, which there, you know, it's almost become cliche now. You hear about creative writing workshops in prison, and, and men and women going to these workshops, and and putting their feelings on paper and writing about their lives and what led them to prison and how this redemptive power of art um, transforms their lives. It wasn't really that. Not to say that it wasn't transformative, um, but you know, we, uh, we realized that this was something that gave us purpose, uh, this group. Um, and we just kind of carved out our own um, uh, our own program there that that really 
made us feel like we were contributing for the first time for some of us in you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. Uh, you know, we have we had one guy in the group uh, in this veterans group um, who's been incarcerated really for most of the past forty years, and this was something that really gave him. Um, a sense of belonging for the first time in a very, obviously very long time. So, um, you know, writing about uh, criminal justice reform, um, as I have been doing for the last several years, I started doing it while I was incarcerated, um, has, has really been um, an important part of my life during incarcer incarceration and post-incarceration. Um, I can't really imagine anything that has been um, as rewarding as, as what I've been doing for the last several years and what I do now. And, um, you know, I, I credit people like Madeline, although there aren't that many people like Madeline, um, who, who engage people on the inside, um, who uh, make us feel connected once again to the outside world in some way. So it's really important for me and anywhere that I go and especially when I have an opportunity to, to be somewhere with Madeline that she's recognized for um, that engagement. It's really important and it's, uh, it's probably the, the most difficult first step for people who, who want to take part in this sort of uh, um, reform movement, working with people on the inside. So I just want to recognize Madeline for the work that she does. Would you both like to entertain our <coughs> questions now? Sure. Sure. Um, I want to remind people too, if you want to pass the box, it would be wonderful. Just You don't have to write about emptiness or Valentine. Anything you want to greeting would be great. It would be wonderful to take. And it's all anonymous. Thank you. Well, Joe, you were a journalist um, before you went in, and what was it like to take those skills uh, as a journalist and work with them inside? Did you produce journalism while inside? Yeah, um, I had uh, really what was the good fortune of uh, writing for a publication on the inside called Prison Legal News. Um, it's published by an organization called the Human Rights Defense Center, which is now based in Florida. Um, and Prison Legal News has been around for about 27, 28 years now. It was founded by a former prisoner, a Washington State prisoner, um, named Paul Wright. Uh, Paul is still the editor of the publication. Uh, he started producing basically a 10-page like a newsletter while he was incarcerated, and his father would help him make copies and distribute it to uh, other prisoners and other prisons um, in Washington State. And um, Paul uh, ended up serving, I believe, 17 years of a life sentence. Uh, he was released and uh, really grew this publication. Um, I, I think it has approximately 10,000 subscribers now, um, many of whom are incarcerated. It goes out to uh, attorneys and, and uh, criminal justice reform advocates, um, and so that was uh, it was a great opportunity for me because I actually got paid for every story that I wrote for them, um, and having having a something that could provide me with uh, a way to support myself, a way to have a little more comfort, uh, comfortable life while incarcerated was really important. But also, um, I really didn't know that this sort of journalism was being produced, I, you know, this advocacy journalism. Um, and so it, it uh, obviously is difficult to produce journalism while you're incarcerated. Um, it's not like I can go out and do research or um, search public records or uh, do your typical interview. So what um, Paul and Prison Legal News did was supply me with source material uh, often hundreds of pages of source material that they would mail to me um, that was subject to uh, you know mailroom censors um, but yet it always got through and um, most of the stories that I wrote I wrote by hand uh, usually with a tiny golf pencil because that was all that I had 
and I would produce sometimes 500, 1,000, 5,000 word stories uh, writing on a pad of paper with a, um, a golf pencil and, and source all of uh, all the uh, outlets that contributed to that story. Um, and sometimes I would do 20 or 30 articles in a month. And um, so as you can imagine, that's all I did all day. I would sit at my desk in my cubicle and write and write and write. So. And your hand gets very cramped with those golf yes. pencils. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, for those who are unaware, uh, in uh, U.S. prisons, uh, you do not get pens or pencils. You only get small golf pencils for security reasons, uh, which makes the act of writing uh, can be quite painful, actually. Um, but let's go further. Let me. Um, Madeline, you've talked about um, uh, this idea of uh, full prisons uh, and empty rivers, um, and uh, but it seems to me that both of those have uh, a common link in impoverishment and uh, exploitative economic systems, um, where we empty out human lives, we empty out streams, mm -hmm. um, and. But how do you address it? And particularly, why did you get kicked out of prisons for talking about this? Um, one of the things that the men asked, we again with the empty chair, they, there was a fierce debate about whether that anyone should be sitting here at all, whether I should be represented again. Like half the group felt like better just sit out in the audience. No one can sit in for us. You know, you're not in our chair, so how can you speak for us? Um, and others said no, because again, back to love, you know, if you love deeply enough, then you can also sit in that chair. Um, but one of the things that we came up, that they came up with, again, I'm just trying to relay the month long that we've had, I took the agenda in and just about 20 people have been shaping the writing and how they want this panel to go. So one of the things that, that was come up with is that for questions to try and loop it into some of the writing that exists. Um, so I want to, the whole thing of kicking out of prisons, I want to read a piece, the last one, or maybe somebody would read it. So this was from Monday night, and they debated, this is the Whetstone Group, They're, I mentioned that after a year of having this programming um, in the yard where the veterans unit was, where again, like, there's just been this political consensus, we can't incarcerate our veterans. Um, you all have done a great job of saying, wait a minute, look beyond us, it's not just about us. Um, so there's a second group on a yard that's considered higher security, um, a lot of stories about this yard. And so there was just this divisiveness about um, what to write. And so a couple of the veterans actually worked on this piece, but then debated because they thought, if we say what we really feel, um, if there's you know, Department of Corrections people there, would this get a program kicked out? So they voted on this too, and they wanted it read. Um, this is the kind of thing that's gotten not only my program, but many kicked out. Again, how we create safe spaces for unsafe conversations, and how we really begin through our writing to discuss the very difficult issues in our divided state um, with compassion, but not glossing over it. So would somebody read this last one, this handwriting, um, handwritten one? Would somebody in the audience be willing to read it? Volunteer? Volunteer? I know it's hard with the cursive. Thanks, Marcia. This um, your last one? Yeah, writing symposium. They've worked on it for a week or so, and then stood at the door and thought, you know, is it going to be too controversial? But I'll introduce Marcia They wanted, Plops, it. They wanted it to be read out loud. Okay. Um, during a time of great crisis, Winston Churchill used his, his this is one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Used his notion of being on by, oh, I'm sorry. Urgent nation. Urgent nation. Urgent, I'm sorry, urgent nation on by ordering that doing your best is not enough. Sometimes you must do what is required. As we sit here today in a courtroom, in your city, a state actor is knowingly presenting false evidence. As we sit here today, our budget for the ABC has risen 28%, while during the same period, the education budget barely keeps up with 2.8% inflation. As we sit here today, 
It has been widely reported that Congress just recently intentionally curbed the DEA's power to prosecute Big Pharma for dealing opiates, while at the very same time, Attorney General Jeff Sessions is calling for maximum drug offense sentencing. As we sit here today, nearly one-third of what's still unit is occupied by private contractors pulling in hundreds of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars for questionable operations, no oversight, and mob-like protection by the state, while simultaneously lobbying your legislature for stiffer prison sentences for their future employees and customers. In 2015, 10 people were arrested for bicycle infractions that netted a combined amount of illegal drugs, including weed, weighing less than a penny, but resulted in a combined total of 26 years in prison at a cost of nearly $600,000 to Arizona taxpayers. Just recently, the Public Defender's Office in New Orleans amazingly grew a set of balls and went on a strike in protest of what they called the routine incarceration of innocent men due to a broken and rigged system. Yet today, we sit here on our balls. We applaud your time and efforts to raise awareness. However, just as Gandhi and Martin Luther King discovered, the powers that be only care about dollars, and any attempt for social change utilizing the peaceful approach must be coupled with economic pain. The time has come for doing what is required. Boycott, for example, the Arizona sports teams just for one season, and you'll see immediate response. Talking will go on for years and net zero results. Act and we got your back. Thank you, Marcia. So it's precisely for being inside the system and loving the system enough, including the people who work there, you know, that um, one of the high suicide rates, I believe still, is among correctional officers. So again, how do we look deep enough through our writing, through our words, to be able to create safe spaces for the hardest questions without getting kicked out? Um, but more, that's very small, you know, that's minuscule compared to being in situations where you, it's not a matter of getting kicked out, but then other repercussions, so. Wish they would kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> now that you have been kicked out, Joe, um, the, um, uh, since 2017, you've been teaching at um, University of, uh, University of Arizona. Hi, Grace. Hi. Um, could you tell us how your experience has informed uh, that uh, you're teaching now? Sure. Um, right now I teach a, a workshop at the University of Arizona Poetry Center um, called Narrowing the Distance. And um, what the, the people who, are, uh, who have enrolled in that workshop are training for is to uh, mentor incarcerated writers, to um, nurture their talent, to um, uh, help create a correspondence um, curriculum for creative writing. Um, I've decided this was important because, uh, like I said, I had sort of this, this fraud complex for a long time um, that, you know, before I was incarcerated, created a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of depression, things that led me to act out and, and self-destruct. And when I was incarcerated, um, I was thirsting. I, you know, I was so desperate to um, overcome this. I, I, I wanted to put in the work to really learn to become a better writer. And so, you know, I started doing things like subscribing to Poets and Writers magazine. I started asking literary journals around the country to send me uh, free copies if they were willing to do so. Um, and then uh, one day I looked in the back of a Poets, Writers, Poets and Writers magazine and found the classified section. And in the back there are lots of people who advertise their services as writing coaches or editors. So I sent out about 10 postcards um, to a lot of different coaches and said, look, I'm incarcerated, I'm locked up, I, I, I don't have any money to pay you. Uh, if you would be willing maybe to just throw me a bone every once in a while and give me a writing prompt, maybe critique my work, 
tell me what I can do better, I'd really appreciate it. Most of the people didn't respond. Uh, I had a couple people who said, um, no, I, I just don't have the time to do this for free. I had one woman who said that I didn't deserve her help. Um, and then I had one guy who said, yeah, sure, I'll give you a few. Uh, he was a poet named Wynn Cooper. He wrote uh, a poem about 25 years ago, 30 years ago, called Fun that uh, Sheryl Crow ended up turning into a song, All I Want to Do is Have Some Fun. <laughs> and uh, I believe they, they collaborated on a few different projects later on. But he, he wrote me and started giving me some writing prompts, and it was, it was great. I was, I was at the time incarcerated at a facility in Kingman, Arizona, uh, isolated from so many people. Uh, you know, I mean, it was isolated from Kingman. It was so far, so far out there. Nobody from the community would go in to conduct workshops, to engage prisoners. Uh, and, but this felt really great that somebody out there decided that he was gonna take the time to do this. So uh, that was really the point of, of creating this workshop. We had so many people, I mean, Tucson is such a great writer's community. Um, and we had so many people that wanted to, to engage prisoners. And so I decided, you know, we're, let's just go ahead and and create a workshop to teach people how to communicate with those on the inside through correspondence. Um, and so we've had a, a great response. I have about a dozen people that are in this course. Uh, we've talked about prison life. We've talked about uh, uh, DOC policy and regulations, uh, things that they need to be aware of uh, for getting past uh, the mailroom sensors. Um, you know, whether or not it's important to know what uh, the, the crime that somebody was convicted of. Um, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, we're just about to start our third week of, of the workshop. Um, and so far, everybody seems very motivated and uh, really appreciative to have this, this, this glimpse at what it's really like for an incarcerated writer. Uh, and we just sent out our um, our welcome letters to our participants, most of whom are incarcerated at the Cimarron unit at the uh, uh, prison complex in Tucson. It's not exactly what I wanted because I was trying to reach prisoners in the really isolated areas of the state, but this is all DOC would give me right now. So it's sort of a pilot program and we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to start getting um, participants from places like Kingman and Winslow and Douglas and Yuma, these really you know, they say that those complexes are in those towns, but they're really not. They're about 20 miles out of those towns. Um, and so I'm hoping that we'll, uh, it'll grow from there. And then eventually what we want to do is create sort of this army of, of creative writing mentors that are then able to fan out uh, all, all around the state, are able to go overnight, spend a weekend in these terrible places, and, uh, and be able to go into the prison and actually do these workshops in person. So um, that's the hope and, and that's the goal of, of the workshop. So. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, this is kind of a uh, rolling free form panel. And Grace is here. She managed to find us. And let me introduce her. Uh, uh, Dr. Grace Gomez runs the Reframing Justice Project for American Friends Service Committee, where she works uh, to position directly impacted people to challenge models of justice that are rooted in punishment towards ones that embrace radical community making and healing. Uh, Dr. Gomez is a 2018 Lead with Conviction Fellow with uh, Just Leadership USA. She's a published author, researcher, and public speaker. Her PhD, she holds a PhD from ASU in Justice Studies and a Master of Science degree in uh, Mexican American Studies and Public Health uh, from the University of Arizona. Welcome, Grace. Thank you. That sounds so fancy. Uh -huh. <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice to be here. Would you like to? Um, sure. How, how is everyone doing this? Just kind of doing a brief introduction of what we do, our okay. interests. Anything you want. Yeah, whatever Anything. you want to say. We've already talked about it. No, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so I run the Reframing Justice Program at American Friends Service Committee. Have you talked about AFSC no. at all? So it's a Quaker organization. Um, we have offices in um, the states and also internationally. And every office has a different um, 
focus area, all of them have something to do with social justice. Our office in Arizona uh, works in sentencing reform. Um, when I came to AFSC, I had just graduated with my PhD from Justice Studies here at, at ASU, and um, I had you know, worked for 10 years. How many of you guys are doctoral students in here? Anyone? Yeah, it's brutal, right? <laughs> um, um, but I've worked for 10 years to... Um, hey, I'm with Phoenix Magazine. I'm supposed to take pictures of Joe. Come <laughs> <laughs> on. Yeah, go on, go on, go ahead. All right, all right, uh, Please, but, yeah. um. <laughs> Sorry. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, Joe, Michelle. Sorry. So, yeah, you're sorry. Right. Yeah, I know. Move on. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'd worked for, you know, like 10 years to get into the academy. Um, and my last few years here at ASU were particularly challenging. Um, having a conviction history basically means that um, you have a very precarious life. Um, and I had a student who um, had failed her midterm and um, uh, in anger she printed out my mugshot from 15 years ago and um, passed it around my department um, and emailed it to all of the other students in class. Um, and at that time in my life I was trying to pass basically as a, a civilian. <laughs> and um, the people that needed to know about my record knew about my record, um, and those that didn't, didn't. Um, and all of a sudden I was just outed in this very traumatic um, way. And my department just didn't know how to respond. Um, they had never had a student that they knew of at least uh, that had um, a record. And um, they responded the way that people who are afraid respond. Um, what they did was remove me from the classroom um, and still made me responsible for prepping all of the lectures, doing all of the grading and all of the student communication, but basically ghosted me from the classroom. Um, and my, uh, the head of my dissertation committee unfriended me on Facebook and um, uh, removed herself from, from my committee. Um, her husband unfriended me on Facebook. It was just you know this very traumatic experience. Um, I was definitely persona non grata on campus. Um, and that's what it felt like walking through that, that experience. Um, and I remained unplaced as an um, instructor or a researcher for uh, two years until I filed a complaint with the EEOC and the department was served with a charge of discrimination. Um, the faculty had at the time um, basically said, what do you want um, in exchange for withdrawing your complaint? And I wish that I had not, I wish that I had been more bold um, because I didn't correct the problem and people after me um, experienced some of the same abuses that, that I did. Um, but basically what I asked for was to be able to teach. Um, and I was given a class um, and, you know, kind of kept my eye on the prize of, of a professorship, a tenure track position, which, you know, that's what's positioned as what you're supposed to do. Um, and I uh, was the first in my cohort to graduate. I graduated with three sole publications. Um, and I was selected as the graduate student of the year here at ASU um, and asked to deliver the, the commencement address. Um, and I felt like I had overcome the obstacle of having a record, right? Um, and five days before graduation, the president's office called and um, said that they were revoking the award. Um, they said that, um, <clears throat> giving the award to someone like me would bring shame and embarrassment to the institution and, and the event. Um, and I walked in cap and gown basically to show my children 
you know, like the end result of, of all of these years and all of my absence, basically. Um, but I felt like I was outside of my body. Um, <clears throat> but I, I really couldn't push back at that time because I had been offered a professorship at a, a university here in Arizona. Um, and I didn't want to rock the boat. You know, I wanted to preserve that. Um, I was upfront about my record during um, interviews, and my one-on-one -on -one interview with the dean um, was upfront about it. Um, and they picked me out of over 300 applicants. Um, and I went through contract negotiations and um, made preparations to move. Um, and about a month before school started, they rescinded the offer um, because they were afraid of what the community would say about them hiring a convicted felon. And it was like, you know, all of my kind of like hopes and dreams just like sifted through my hands. Um, and I felt like I couldn't do anything about it. Um, And, and then I just got really like mad. <laughs> you know, Audre Lorde writes about the uses of anger, right? That when wielded correctly, they can be tools. Um, and so this position came up at American Friends Service Committee. And um, it is an organization that views this experience as, as expertise, which it is. Um, because I'm, I'm trained as a, a critical criminologist um, and because I have this unique positionality of having um, been in and still in the criminal punishment system in a very real way. Because once you have a record, you're tagged for the rest of your life. Um, so they viewed that as, um, as a good thing, right? It uniquely prepares me to do the work that I do. And then what they did, which was like really the true blessing, is they said, create whatever you want to create. And so from that experience and from that, that lens, I created Reframing Justice, which basically um, positions, like Joe said, um, people who, have, who are in and have been in the system to lead these conversations around um, not just sentencing reform, but what are we all collectively responsible for? Um, so yeah, it's multimedia. Uh, we do digital stories, um, op-eds, um, and, and the really powerful thing, I think, is um, connecting with people who are still inside um, and bringing their writing, bringing their analysis um, out from behind the walls. Um, and we use their voices also, our voices, to shift policy. So right now there's a, a bill that was just basically killed on the floor, HB 2222, mm -hmm. which would provide unlimited feminine hygiene products to women inside Perryville Prison. Um, so what I did was connect with women inside Perryville through the networks that I established here as a graduate student um, at ASU um, and also connections that I have through my organizing work to get directly impacted women to go and testify at the Rules Committee, or not at Rules, at the, um, it was assigned, yeah, it was assigned to the Military <laughs> Veterans and Regulatory Affairs Committee, a committee of nine men, <laughs> to hear a bill on menst menstrual equity. Um, the chairman, uh, the chairman, oh my gosh, you guys can actually find this online. Um, he said, if I would have known I would have been hearing about periods and pads, I would have never agreed to hear this bill. It's pretty. You got duped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so it passed that committee, went to the Rules Committee, and um, the chairman, um, basically what I would say in backdoor dealings with, with ADC, decided that it was not uh, necessary to legislate this this issue that DOC could do a rule change within their policy and keep it in-house, um, 
which is like the police investigating themselves. They always find themselves innocent. Um, so women inside Perryville wrote testimonies and, and sent those kites out um, around why this legislative change is so important. Um, also women who had done time in Perryville um, just worked with us on, a, on an op-ed that we're submitting to Huffington Post and the Feminist Wire. Um, you know, and what's different, there's been a lot of writing about uh, 2222. Oh, so many outlets have, have written about it. But what always seems to happen is that other people think that they need to speak for us rather than come alongside us and help us publish things in our own voice if we lack access, right? Everyone has a voice, including people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. What we frequently lack access to is a platform. Um, so, yeah, just a little snippet of the stuff we do. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to open for questions from the audience. Uh, I, I, maybe I'll jump in first, however. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested uh, because one of the things we, we want to do is uh, create pathways from uh, prisons into universities for ex-prisoners. And um, uh, so I, I, I'd like to have sort of the benefit of your experience, if we could. How should this university change in its dealings with ex-prisoners? Well, I think first stop calling us ex-prisoners. Um, we're human beings. So uh, lead with people first language. So. Um, if you regard us as human beings and as community members, then you're going to treat us as human beings and community members. But if we remain an otherized category, then we're always like animals in the zoo. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that um, part of it is, is a language change. Language is really, really important and really powerful, right? What are you um, recommending? Um, so some, some administrative shifts that would be really important would be, you know, banning the box um, on... It's the uh, people first mm -hmm. language. Oh, suggesting for people, people first, first language. language. Yeah. Um, so you can say people who have been incarcerated, mm -hmm. people who are currently incarcerated, um, returning community members or community members. Um, basically putting an X in front of anything doesn't do anything to dispel the power of that label. So to say X offender, what you're still registering is offender, or X felon, what you're still registering is felon, or X prisoner, you're still registering prisoner. So, um, yeah. People who are system involved. Uh -huh. I got that from her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else that um, can be recommended? Well, uh, that's, I think, the first first step, but there are, like I was beginning to say, policy changes. I think, how many of y'all are faculty members here at ASU? Yes, yes. So I think pushing and advocating for people who um, have been system involved. Um, you know, when I was going through the, the process of, um, uh, you know, interviewing for an academic position. Um, there was a lot of thought and strategy put into when to tell, how to tell, and worry around how I'm going to be received and will I be abused. Um, so I think there's some really deep work that has to be done and organizing that has to be done or, uh, with faculty members, around faculty members, organizing with students um, as well, to create a safe environment um, on university campuses. Um, I didn't have people in positions of power to advocate for me. Um, so when there were abuses, I was alone in navigating these systems. Um, and I wish that there was a community of support on campus as you felt like a very hostile environment. Um, and there's definitely trauma associated with coming back here. Anytime I've come back here, um, it doesn't feel good. If I could 
Can I say something along those lines too? No offense to the academy or to academics, but my favorite classes when I was in college were not taught by PhDs. They were taught by people with practical experience. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to take classes in criminal justice studies or prison studies, if such a program uh, is created, uh, that are taught by people with real experience mm -hmm. uh, being incarcerated, being in the system. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. I just want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Motion. I just wanted to throw an idea out there. Thank you so much. I, I can't tell you all how much I appreciate your work. You guys are just fantastic. And I hear about like Madeline and Joe, like from, from the guys in Weston, they just love you guys so much. Um, but one thing I just wanted to throw out there is, as an idea is, you know, we have all of these programs to promote diversity on different campuses. Wouldn't it be great if having a history where your system impacted qualified you for, as, as one of the categories that we actually sought out to try to bring into classrooms so that rather than accounting against you, it could actually be something that we can start saying, well, we, you know, like we can start kind of making hires on that basis. A diversity marker, yeah. This yeah. is something that we've talked about um, a little bit at, uh, at the U of A, with leadership at the U of A. Um, a few months ago, uh, we organized a symposium at the university, I think you, you went, right? Mm -hmm. Called um, Building the Prison to Hire <coughs> Pipeline and what that looks like. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really, um, that would be a really creative way um, to kind of upend this, this stigma a little bit too. Other questions? I just, had, I just had a thought about recruiting people who are coming out of prison who have been incarcerated and have a meeting with a recruiter on my I have an issue but on the West Campus and we're talking about people we have whose enrollments are done. So we've got all the ones I'll worry about. I mean, how does one there's gotta be some way to recruit you know, really actively go and create that pipeline from from the recruiter's office. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what that looks like or how that would look like. Well, we have classes that run run inside. Um, so the the work that I started here as a graduate student, um, it's a program called Humanities Behind the Walls, um, and that's been going on inside Perryville Prison since 2011. We started our first our first class. Um, so you you'd have to in my opinion, connect with people who are teaching inside. One of the conversations that we've been a part of, the, the three of us here, is creating a fellowship program. Um, so the university strategically investing in um, creating that, that pipeline. Um, so developing a fellowship. And, and you know the other thing, in, in much of the work that happens inside and outside, um, there is a whole category of people that are exempted from any kind of services. So they call, Marie Gottschalk calls them the non-non-nons in the book Caught. Um, so um, if you um, have a charge of a sex offense, if you have been convicted of something that is uh, considered a violent crime, or if you've been termed a habitual offender, there is little to zero programs available to you, inside and out. Um, so when we were talking about this, this fellowship and what that might look like, um, we were thinking of people investing in people who have longer sentences and who qualify, who are exactly that population. And there is national work that um, strategically looks to, to work with people that, are, that fall into that category. So it's generation five. Mm -hmm. Um, they work with families um, and people who um, have experienced sexual abuse. So they went for like the gugui of all offenses, right? So like the worst thing that you could do, and that's the population that they have chosen to work with. So um, um, a fellowship where you're investing in a student um, 
four or five years and creating that opportunity for them on the outside, is that being part of the fellowship, I think would be really powerful. But again, we need the buy-in from institutions to be able to make that happen. I feel like we have the people. <laughs> we have the fellows. Um, we need institutional support. Other other questions? Questions? Yeah, please. I'm curious um, about uh, what, what you might think about the, uh, the role of higher education or, or you know, in, in changing public political perceptions about, uh, about the prison system. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, there, there's, there's work we can do with um, those who've been recently incarcerated, there's work we can do in the prisons, but given the sort of larger political culture that we're inhabiting, it would seem like what we also need is a kind of change of consciousness on the outside so that some of these things can actually be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So what would the role of prison studies, the teaching of the prison uh, to non-incarcerated students be in your, in your sense? What, 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 you know, for those of us who are in the academy teaching classes, shaping curriculum, what would you advise? That you speak to experts. So we are experts by experience, and I'm degreed too. And there are others of us that are also degreed. So um, I think that a prison studies program, and this is something that's being discussed at the University of Arizona, is developing an entire discipline. Um, um, is a, a great idea in terms of churning out activist scholars that can shape um, the conversation and the theory um, and the policies that, that, that then emerge. Um, I think who teaches those classes and who is shaping that curriculum is so important. Um, uh, the academy, I think, is very insulated in many ways. Um, many times in the academy you're publishing and that work is not accessible to the general public at all and you don't get credit for it either and you know you're like everyone's caught in this racket right like in order to get to to tenure you need to publish in certain outlets and um, uh, public scholarship is not necessarily counted but that public scholarship like getting this content out of the ivory tower and into communities that can be used as a tool, right? Um, but not as, you know, we are uh, the knowledge holders and we're going to impart our knowledge to you, but working with communities that are actually doing the work um, to uh, conduct research, um, to, to publish, you know, um, I think it, it would look really different than what the justice studies program looks like. Definitely the criminology department looked totally different. Um, but I think that that connection to community and to directly impacted people um, is, is vital. I could uh, add to that. So, you know, I'm a white articulate guy who got out of prison. I, I think people, um, look at my experience, my expertise, uh, me sharing my experience a little differently than they do someone of color, someone who doesn't come from my privileged background. Um, I think that what's also important is that the academy starts compensating the people who have, who are directly impacted, the people who have the the people who are experts, who have the practical experience that inform um, research, that inform these classes that are created, these departments, prison studies departments that are created, it's, they're all built on the expertise and knowledge of people who are directly impacted, but those people too often are brought out as a sideshow mm -hmm. and aren't compensated for their expertise. Mm -hmm. If they were compensated for their expertise, they might be able to um, earn a living wage, like I currently am. Um, they might be able to drive up here to Tempe from Tucson 
on uh, a Wednesday morning on Valentine's Day when I should be spending the whole day with my wife um, and be able to, to come up here and, and, and talk to you. I'm fortunate because I have a great job that pays me a living wage, but there are so many more people out there who have, uh, you, you know, I, I have 10 years of experience being incarcerated. There are people out there with 20, 25, 30 years that you should be hearing from who aren't as fortunate and as privileged as I am. They need to be compensated. The Academy needs to share the wealth. Um, these research dollars that, that the Academy is getting need to be passed on to people who are directly impacted. Could I dovetail? I, um, I have a letter, it's personal, it's not in the packet, but it was handed by um, a young man who was in juvenile detention and now he just turned 19 and it just dovetails so, um, with his request. Um, I always had a dream of being committed to my community and trying to bring people as a whole together and raise the community's awareness to the foul play that our so-called government denies but stands for. Anyway, my epiphany is that I feel like you all have the necessary knowledge and resources that could truly help me on my path. I understand this, must be, this may be unprofessional, and if you do decide that it is um, difficult to stay in touch, if you could get in trouble, but I give you my word on my last breath that I would never say about a word of any of this to anyone. But what I'm seeking to establish is a sturdy foundation. So when I get out, I will have a small network established and I can really do something with the community. I would really like to target the young kids at risk youth. I feel like since I've really been there and done that, I would know exactly how to reach them. But this is just one idea, I have many. Now, if I'm tripping and you cannot support me, um, I understand completely and I will nev never bring it up again. This is just an idea I had. I remember when we were talking in class about the problems of getting kicked out of places. <laughs> My perspective of the system is they really don't want people to wake up and realize that we need unity or we need to make the change we want to see in this world. So they shut down people who are capable of waking people up. Um, we need people willing to put in the effort needed to be about positive energy, but the bottom line is the struggle must continue. Anyway, I'm going to cut this short. Thank you for your time. Anthony. We have time for one last question. Yes. Thank you for sharing. Um, I just want to say that we are on Octave and Pashland and to give space and justice to um, this land that we all occupy currently. Um, but I just want to like touch on this idea of like rehabilitation um, because within American Indian Studies, I'm a master's student within that program. We talk about this idea of um, like relocation and like the removal of our people from our communities and this idea of like rehabilitation and bringing them back into our communities and um, and then when you mentioned like are we walking up some of our leaders um, I wanted to write and expand more on this idea of um, this scout mentality and this warrior mentality that exists in a lot of indigenous communities and <laughs> sorry um, but I do like believe that there's like a, we do walk up a lot of this warrior mentality because a lot of our men do experience, you know, rage and anger, and a lot of it's because they don't. This system and the society is not created for them, and so they see this frustration. They see their mothers, their sisters, and their aunties continuing to struggle with a um, hyper patriarchal system that's targeted against them, and so there's not really a, a safe space and so I noticed like a lot of them um, find outlets in very violent circles you know people talk about gangs within our in our society or you know even just like really um, that hard that hardness of like that outlet of death metal provides in my community like you know just that really hardness and um, so like I mean I really want to I don't know if you um, if there's this like idea of uh, like justice and and are they really providing justice for the people who are, are being victimized by these behaviors and and this idea of like all right well I have to 
be like you know this idea of rehabilitation back in the community and and not really um, providing justice to those people that were actually harmed by maybe their criminal act or their behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but like, is there any so is there something like that where they they're able to come to terms with like you know like providing justice to who like their families and their communities and whom they may have hurt and and then and then you know providing that circle so they could provide better healing because I don't I honestly don't believe the justice system provides justice um, for our community members you know like exactly what your experience goes through you know my mom goes through that experience as well and I know so many of my friends who go through that where they continue to be ostracized like like as if they don't matter but for me it's like you're supposed you did your time you're supposed to be re rehabilitated why should we continue to provide this like the, these um, chains to our, our family members so thank you for sharing but if you could thank touch, you touch on sure. that yeah so I, I want to be clear that from my perspective, the system as it exists has nothing to do with justice. Mm -hmm. What we have is a punishment system, which is really different from our, our ideas of justice. As it's organized, what we have is this you know, adversarial system that prevents people from you know, having this critical space where if you've harmed someone or if you have been harmed, that harm and that pain can be transformed into something else that serves both people. That kind of corrects that path where the person maybe who has committed that harm is able to choose a different path mm -hmm. and the person who has been harmed can articulate what it is that they need to feel restored. But many times people who have experienced harm um, never feel like justice is served no matter how much time a person gets no matter how much time that person does, um, or even if they're sentenced to death. Like you hear, you can read um, statements by people who have witnessed you know, a person be executed, feel, say that they didn't feel, they still don't feel restored. <coughs> and that's because there isn't a process that exists that actually transforms that harm and that pain into something that's life-giving. So that's not going to happen within the system. That happens within community. That happens within radical community <coughs> making. That's something that we do for ourselves, not something that we ask the state for. Mm -hmm.